Hi folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is season 16, episode two. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we are once again. Great to have you with me. Thank you so much for joining me. Before we get to retirement, it helps to have some kind of a vision of what it's going to look like. Now, in this season, we're going to be dealing with the things that you need to think about as retirement looms over the horizon. No longer is it a hazy one day possibility. It's coming up pretty fast. And so we need to get serious about what we want it to look like so that we can be ready. So we're going to look about refining the vision today. Not going to help you, you know, uh, dream or anything like that. That's your business. What we're going to do is get practical and talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But after the main body of the show, I'll read a review that's been left out, announce what we're going to be talking about next week. But of course, you know the drill by now. This podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out here on Meaningful Money for absolutely ages, and I'm really grateful to them for their long-term and very generous support. So please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Go check them out and say thanks. Right. Retirement, yes, it's hoving into view, getting much clearer, and you will be getting a much clearer picture of what it's going to look like. So today I want to go over some things to think about, and then really the practicalities of making sure that the money meets the vision. Now remember, notes, links, all from today's show, they're at the show notes, which is the only link you need to remember. Meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS2, that's for The Home Straight Episode 2. The Home Straight is what we're uh, calling this season, the sort of run into retirement. So show notes, meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS2. Let's have a look at everything you need to know first. Okay, first thing we need to know is that your retirement will evolve, okay? The danger when we're talking about retirement, particularly when we're this side of it, I say that as somebody who's 45 nearly, right? So uh, in the working side of retirement, the danger of it is to treat the whole thing as a kind of single event when, in fact, of course, God willing, it'll be a very long period of time for many of us, the last third of our life. So it's ridiculous to expect every day to be the same across a 30-year time scale. What will actually happen, of course, is that 30-year retirement, maybe even 40, will be made up of many different, much shorter phases, if you like. Obviously, there's no such thing as an average retirement, but many of the clients that I've known over the years of doing my job as a financial planner, they've spent more money in the first five years of retirement than in every subsequent five-year period. Why? Well, obviously, they have the time, the resources, and hopefully the health to make best use of the first years in retirement. So they tend to have more holidays, change the car, buy a camper van, take up new, more expensive hobbies. But then things do tend to settle down and find a groove, and spending does the same. Obviously, there's always exceptions, right? You have one-off expenses like big birthdays or family events like weddings or maybe grandchildren going to university. But for the most part, expenditure becomes fairly predictable once it settles down. Actually, on average, retired people's expenditure decreases by about a third. A third, that's a heck of a sort of reduction, really in real terms between the ages of 65 and 80, according to one study by the International Longevity Center UK. And all that means that most likely, the gap between your income and your expenditure will be largest in the early years of your retirement. If you retire before your state pension age, which many of us hope to do, then there's gonna be a period where you won't be receiving all of the secured income that you will eventually have once your state pensions pay out. So you'll be drawing on your capital to a greater extent in the early years of your retirement than in the later ones. Subject, of course, to long-term care fees and all that sort of stuff, but we'll get to that in a future season, perhaps. But retirement will evolve. It won't be the same every day for 30 years. Your spending will change. Your lifestyle will change. Second thing we need to know is that cash flow is everything. I think this is a good time to remind ourselves that that 
is the truth. Cash flow is everything. No matter how wealthy we might be, we all tend to judge our financial health by the amount of income we have coming in. If that's less than we are spending going out, then we know that we're getting poorer, right? Now, when we're planning for our retirement, our starting point needs to be secured income. So let me define that for you. Secured income is income which is guaranteed and in many cases likely to rise. So your state pension would fall into that category. Benefits from defined benefit pension schemes would also be secured income. If you've got an annuity, that would be secured income, guaranteed for life. If you've got a rental property, one could argue that that's secured in that you have an asset which produces an income, but it's not guaranteed. Uh, it's likely to be variable, of course, if you suffer blank periods and have high maintenance costs and things like that. Now, remember that you might well continue to earn an income in, quotes, retirement by doing part-time work or jobs or whatever, and that would also be secured income. Once we know what our secured income is likely to be, we can then identify the gap between that and our expenditure. So I'm going to come back to that a little bit in a minute. But that gap, of course, is going to need to be filled by drawing from capital. Now, if we draw too heavily, or if we don't invest intelligently enough, then the value of our capital will be eroded over time. So it's important then to have a clear picture of our expenditure uh, so that we can work out how much capital we're going to need. Of course, there are a million variables involved here, so let's not worry about it too much. But it is important to know what we're going to be spending. Third thing I think we need to know, though, and we need to be aware of, is the crucial distinction between required minimum expenditure and our desired lifestyle, right? There is expenditure and expenditure. So we've got to distinguish between costs that are mandatory and those which are discretionary. And I tend to use the words required and desired to distinguish between these. So required expenditure is what you need to spend to keep the lights on, food in the fridge, right? Needs to include any travel costs to and from the supermarket or your local town or to visit family. Insurances for the home, any life insurances, they would fall into that category as well. Basically, the minimum standard stuff that you're going to need to spend. Then there's a kind of gray area, right, where things which one person might consider a luxury are in fact a necessity for you. So that might be a golf club membership if you've been a lifelong golfer and you can't imagine retirement without being able to go to the golf club when you want. Or if you love your box sets, then you might consider Netflix a mandatory minimum cost, right? It's your life and it's your money, so you need to make this distinction. But for now, I just think it's important to understand the distinction between the two. Consider your required expenditure to be a minimum lifestyle cost without too many bells and whistles, bells and whistles and luxuries, okay? You need to try and identify what that might be. But hang on, you know, I... Th yeah, I thought we were talking about refining your vision of retirement, and so far we seem to be talking about fairly dry stuff like expenditure and secured income. Where's the visionary bit, right? Well, remember we're in the run-in to retirement now. We're on the home straight. Our vision should now be much more focused than it was 10 or 20 years ago, and that means in financial terms we need to get detailed. So last week I asked you to start thinking about what it might look like, what your retirement might look like, and maybe to dream a little bit. But now I'm afraid we've got to get practical, and that means pounds and pence. Let's have a look at everything you need to do. Okay, first thing we need to do is to cost it out. It's time to start writing things down, folks, okay? So depending on how you manage your finances currently, you might have a greater or lesser amount of clarity about what you are spending every month. I know you're not retired yet, but your general household running costs won't change that much when you are. So you should be able to fairly accurately identify what your required expenditure level is. After that, then, we're in the realms of costing out luxuries and occasional costs, like changing the car every five years or whatever. That's going to be less exact, I think, but, you know, if you're taking holidays now, that'll be a guide. If you change your car every five years now, that will be a guide. So ask yourself, when you retire, will you buy and run the same kind of car as you do now? Will you take the same kinds of holidays as you do now? If so then the cost should be fairly clear. The aim here is to pin down a likely required and desired lifestyle cost for the early years of your retirement. 
put a figure on that and then maybe <laughs> add a margin of error 10 or 20 percent or something depending on how accurate you've been costing it out if you are a sort of wet finger in the air type of person then i think now is probably the time to get a little bit more granular than you might be immediately comfortable with but it is important so don't stick uh, skip it okay don't round to the nearest £5,000 per year expenditure. That's too woolly. Try to get to the nearest £500 or uh, at worst, the nearest £1,000 a year of expenditure. Okay. Second thing we need to do is to establish our income sources. So once you have your expenditure written down, we need to turn our attention to sources of income. We're going to start with secured sources of income, beginning with your state pension. So if you haven't already, you need to get state, for, uh, state pension forecasts for you and your partner. I'll put a link in the show notes to the page where you can get that done. Then we've got to establish any other secured pension benefits, such as those from old defined benefit schemes. If you're a current member of such a scheme, you're going to need to dig out your most recent annual statement. You should still get those even if you're a deferred member. You're not in the scheme anymore, but it can be easy to lose track if it's not current, if you like particularly if you've moved house and you haven't informed your scheme of your new address, then you won't be getting statements. So take the time to think back over your career. Try and build a timeline of who you worked for and when. Did you have a pension at each of those employments? If so, do you still have a record of those plans? Are those records up to date? If not, then now is the time to reach out to those companies and try to track down your pension provisions. Use the government's pensions tracing service if you don't have contact details for any companies. There's a link to that in the notes as well. If you have things like deferred annuities or widow's pensions, note those down as well. Next week, I'm going to look a little bit in, uh, in a bit more detail about how to get current. But for now, you just want to know what your various income sources will be and when they will pay out. Really important. Chances are you're going to have some pensions kicking in at different ages and you need to plan for this changing income structure as time goes on. Third thing we need to do, define the shortfall. Once we know both our expenditure and our income figures should be fairly straightforward to work out the difference between the two. Now for the purpose of this exercise, you're looking for the point at which the difference between the two is greatest, which is likely to be early on in your intended retirement. So let's say you've got one pension kicking in at age 60, another at age 65, and your state pension at 67. Your partner, if applicable, you know, they might be a different age to you. Uh, he or she might have similar staged set of incomes over time. And so your income is likely to be building over time, and it's going to be lowest at the beginning of the process, lowest when you just retire, probably. And at the same time, as we've said, your expenditure is likely to be highest earlier on in retirement. So the biggest shortfall is, is therefore likely to be in the first five years, unless you're planning to take maybe lower paid or part-time work. What you're trying to do is to build a timeline of income, what's coming in and when, and then we need to determine the greatest shortfall between that and your expenditure. Number four that we need to do, determine the goal, right? Once you've got your point of greatest shortfall, we're going to apply a rule of thumb. And it is very much just that. Okay, it's just a rule of thumb. Don't stress out about this. Okay, don't leave me messages and stuff. It's just a rule of thumb. Whatever you determined your largest shortfall to be, multiply that figure by 25. Right? Now, maybe that will give you a very scary number, right? But don't panic just yet. Right? I reckon that'll be a, a bigger, higher number than you actually need to retire. Hopefully you've made some good progress towards attaining it by saving into pensions and stuff uh, as anyway. But in all of this, you're going to need to be aware of inflation, right? You should be using figures in today's money ideally, but you can work back from them. If you're given figures that are anticipated at your retirement date, you can work those back. There's a link in the notes to an inflation calculator to help you do that. Now, assuming you're in the 10 years before your intended retirement date, that is still long enough for inflation to be a factor. So try and work everything back into today's money. That is the only kind of money we can understand. We know what things cost now, but we won't know what they cost in the future. I've never met anybody who can do this in their heads, right? So we need to work only in today's money. It's the only money that makes any sense. Now, eventually, you're going to need to get to a point where you have a target figure. 
So listen back to season 15, episode three. I'll put a link in the notes for more detail on that. That target figure for our capital, the money we're going to need to bridge the gap between our income and our expenditure, that's what we're aiming for, right? I'm going to trust you to exercise some common sense in this. So if the figure you get is, to your mind, crazily high, then remember, it's a 25 times multiple of the highest difference between your secured income and your expenditure. Probably you can manage with way less than that. But you know what? Think of it as a target, right? Nobody ever regretted having more money behind them when they retired than less, okay? Now, when we get into the planning stages, it could be useful to have access to some kind of planning tool, right? Just to do the mathematical heavy lifting for you. Now, you have a couple of options here. My sponsors, 7IM, have a free app called 7Imagine. I'll put a link to that in the notes as well. And that has a tool called My Future, which is really good. It's actually much better than really good. It's exceptional for a free app. And you don't have to be a client of 7IM to access it. Even better is Voyant Go, which is available through Meaningful Academy in its second and third phases. But the problem is phase two is still being built. Should be ready by about Easter. That's Easter 2020, depending on when you're listening to this. Phase three isn't even started yet, but if you are interested, you can leave your name and email address at meaningfulacademy.com to get on the list to be notified when they go live. We've got some founder members in the Build Well phase of Meaningful Academy at the minute, and they have access to Voyant Go, and they are loving it. Very active uh, in there, because I see when people change their plans, um, and they're loving the ability to try different retirement models. It's, it's very cool. Okay, that'll do for today, I think. Hopefully, you've got a sense of what is needed to begin planning your trajectory into retirement. We've got a lot of work to do yet, right? We're building. That's what we tend to do with these seasons is we build week after week after week. But it's going to be so worthwhile, I tell you, because you will know if you're in the running, the home straight to retirement, you'll know what it is that you have to do to get everything ready. Okay, this is a review called Brilliant Podcast by Pompey J. Pete's podcasts are brilliant. I've listened to several series worth now, but you can pick and choose in order to cover your personal circumstances. The new, uh, the new Accumulators series really spoke to me. If you like what you hear on the podcast, um, oh, you know, <laughs> I sort of carried on reading then uh, as if it was uh, the review, but it's not. If you like what you hear <laughs> on this podcast, I thought that was Pompey J. Uh, if you like what you hear on the podcast, leave me a review, right? Meaningfulmoney.tv slash iTunes, just like Pompey J did. Um, oh, wherever you're listening to this, please leave me a review. It really helps uh, to keep the show near the top of the rankings, which means people can find it and then subscribe. It's going nuts at the moment, folks. January was a record uh, month for downloads, 125,000 downloads, <laughs> closing in on 3.5 million total. So thank you for your support. But you know what? I need your help to get the message out to as many people as possible. So leave me a review. Okay. Don't forget, Meaningful Academy, the first phase is open, right? There's going to be three, right? <laughs> but at the minute, there's only one. So if you're not at the retirement stage yet, but actually you're looking to get started with your finances, then the first phase, which we call financial foundations, is perfect for you. It covers everything from mindset, goal setting, setting and sticking to a budget, debt elimination, basics of personal insurance and saving and investing, tons of stuff, video lessons, worksheets, calculators, everything you need to get started on your personal financial journey and start it off right. Head over to MeaningfulAcademy.com. Everything you need to know is there. But don't forget, if you're a podcast listener, you get 25% off by using the coupon code PODCAST25. All one word, PODCAST25. Okay. Next time, we're going to be talking about getting current. That is, determining the state of play with your current finances so that you can be well positioned for planning your retirement. Okay, that's it, folks, for this session. Hope you enjoyed it. Questions, comments, all the links, show notes, meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS2. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you next week. Cheers.